Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we've got something new to show you. We've got the YJT UV8F Plus. Now, I've not heard of YJT before, and it's not a brand that I'm really familiar with, but the radio itself does look a bit like a Baofeng. Um, probably reminiscent of the UV5R or something similar to that. But anyway, um, it's available in the UK from East Anglian Radio Services, and I must uh, say a big thanks to Paul for sending this one up to me, so uh, thank you very much Paul. Uh, he's one of the regulars on the TM1 forums, his name's Paul Ears, so if you see him on there do say hello. Um, he sells a lot of radio gear to the marine uh, industry and everything, and apparently YJT do make a number of marine transceivers too at affordable prices. So when they offered him this, um, when he was placing some orders with his suppliers, he jumped at the chance to take some and uh, give it a try out, so uh, here it is. So the UV 8F by JYT. Now, as I said before, it looks like a Baofeng transceiver, but it does have some different functions, which we'll show in a few minutes. Uh, frequency coverage is more or less the same as normal, 136 to 174, and 400 to 470 megahertz. So pretty much standard for a dual band radio these days, so no surprises there. The menu system seems a little bit different on this radio. Um, it's got nice clear display, uh, proper dot matrix, um, as you can see there. I'm not going to go through every single feature because it's pretty much the same as a Baofeng in that respect. But it does have Vox, uh, three power levels, bandwidth, uh, backlighting, timeout, dual standby, dual watch, etc. But it does have some other tricks up its sleeve, which we'll talk about in a minute. You do get a desktop charger with the radio, which is this one here, pretty much standard again with the red and green LED for charge status. But one unique feature on this particular transceiver is that it does have a USB port too. So if you happen to be caught out somewhere without the desktop charger, or you're away for a holiday, or you take it with you anywhere for the day, you can generally find a micro USB connector to plug into. Sadly, it's not USB type C, which would have been actually better for this type of transceiver. However, we're not complaining, it's a welcome feature. The only uh, slight strange thing about this is that when you do plug into the USB, there's no charge status indicator whatsoever on the display of the radio, and there's no lights to tell you when it's fully charged. So you just have to guess, basically. Um, it takes about three hours to fully charge, I think, via USB. I did take it on holiday with me this year, but um, wasn't able to actually measure the exact time on that one. But uh, it does seem to take around two to three hours to fully charge if it's flat. Okay, so we've got the radio plugged into a Shawcom SW102 power meter and it's got a dummy load on the end to give us an accurate representation of the power output. So we're gonna try transmitting on high power on the radio and let's see what we get. Here we go. And as you can see, 4.31 watts, which is pretty respectable. The radio claims five watts of power output, but we're seeing about 4.3 or something in that region anyway. So there you go, that's it on the um, high power. Let's just uh, change the settings on this one then and see if we can get down to mid power, which is gonna be our next one. So let's try again. Okay, so mid power range, just under two watts there. So hovering around the two watt mark anyway, which is what we'd expect for mid power. And let's finally try low power. TX on low power. And actually the low power level is too low for the meter to actually read. Um, that's a held value that is from the mid power there and it's not actually even detecting the RF so it must be way under one watt because this meter can't detect under about one watt of power anyway so I'd have to assume it is just actually under one watt of power which is good for QRP but uh, yeah it's the first time I've actually seen that on a radio where it doesn't actually detect on the meter so uh, that's quite interesting so for most people I think you'd probably want to run it at the mid power level perhaps if you're using it for amateur radio or something like that and maybe just in 446 mode run the uh, low power to make it the equivalent of just over half a watt maybe but uh, I'm only guessing because I can't measure it down that far anyway on that particular meter and now I'm going to show you the one feature you'd probably want to buy this two-way radio for and no, it's not the compulsory flashlight torch in the top of the radio. As you know, many Chinese radios have one of these in, and some people love them, some people hate them. Not only can you do that with this one, but you can also turn it off again. Wow, amazing. So anyway, some of them do flash actually, but this one doesn't. But uh, anyway, uh, we've also got another programmable button on the side that you can reassign, of course, but this one triggers the FM radio, which we're not going to show on this review because we will get a copyright claim from YouTube if we do that. But anyway, enough of all that nonsense. The real thing that you want to see this radio for is its close call feature. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Uniden scanners have had this feature in for a number of years. Basically, if a radio transmits nearby, you can grab the frequency of the nearby 
uh, RF and also show the CTCSS and DCS tone. So for this one, we've got another PMR radio. This is a Kenwood, uh, quite an old school one actually. It's the THK40, just a UHF FM radio, which is programmed upon 446 for the demonstration. So all being well, what you're gonna see is that when I transmit on this radio, you're gonna see the frequency appear on that radio. It's gonna demodulate it, and we're also gonna see the CTCSS code that we're using on the display. Incidentally, it does DCS as well and it can do one band at a time, VHF or UHF. So to put the radio into that mode, all you need to do is press the menu button and then press the star. And as you can see, it goes into a mode called Seek. And on the moment it says UHF, but if you press the downwards arrow key, I think it's downwards arrow key, there we go, there you can trigger between VHF and UHF. So depending on what radio you're trying to capture, you can switch between the two bands. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna transmit on the Kenwood and it's on channel one, PMR446, and we're gonna see if it can grab the frequency correctly and uh, decode the CTCSS tone. Now, if it does come up on the display, you can actually write the memory back into the radio as well, which is quite a cool feature. So if you're trying to identify an unknown transceiver, like a PMR radio that you're not sure what frequency it's transmitting on, then this could be an idea or, or a solution maybe to uh, do that. So let's give it a try. So what we're gonna do is give it a quick burst of RF, and it's come up as 446.0125 uh, hertz tone, which isn't quite there, it's, it's 6.25 kilohertz out. So what I found sometimes with the 6.25 kilohertz steps, we need to actually do it a couple of times. So if you are trying to identify a radio, it's not giving consistent readings, maybe take the best of three, as they say. And there you are, this time it's worked out correctly, 446.00625 and a tone of 88.5 hertz on uh, CTCSS. Let's try that one more time, see if we get the same result again. And as you can see there, it's shifted around a little bit. I mean, the uh, tone code's correct, but the frequency isn't. Now, I think this feature works better with five kilohertz steps. So for a lot of radios, or 12.5 kilohertz steps, for example, I don't think it'd be a problem. I think it has slight differential problems when it gets down to 6.25 kilohertz. Let's try that again. And there you go. And it may also depend how far the antenna is from the other radio because you do need to be pretty close proximity in order to make this work successfully. But that is a unique feature and one that I've not seen inside uh, such a low-cost transceiver before. So it is good or it is handy for working out uh, you know, what's going on with a particular radio if you're unsure or if it's a radio without a display that doesn't give you any clues to the frequency or you haven't got the programming. So if you just wanted to clone a PMR radio very quickly to use with a load of other radios on the same band, then you could maybe just use this, which is a really good little feature. Other than that, it's basically a standard two-way radio with five watts output. The battery pack is 3,200 milliamp hours, and it does seem to last a fair amount of time as well. Charging on the desktop charger takes about two hours roughly, and like I say, there's nothing really to uh, complain about. However, I did find some other interesting observations here, but we're gonna take a look at it in action first, and then I'll give you my conclusions as to what I think of this particular radio. So let's take it out on the hilltops and give it a try, see what we can get. Okay, hopefully, Rod, you can hear me. I've got the camera going like and that, so do you wanna say hello to everybody on YouTube there? Yeah, no worries, mate. Uh, yeah, this is Romeo Delta 1-5, talking to Mr. Simon just outside the town of Ralph and uh, good contact up to the front of head, Roger. Yeah, Roger, Roger, that's pretty impressive, I must say, uh, Rod. I mean, I don't know how many miles it is from here. What do you reckon it is, roughly, from your location? How many miles do you think it would be? Go ahead. Uh, I would hazard a guess around 55, 60 miles. Yeah, Roger on that one. Well, like I say, just using the standard antenna, which you'll see in the video when I finally get round to publishing it, and um, just a standard rubber duck antenna, no tricks up my sleeve or anything, and uh, just four watts of output, Roger. All copied, friend, all copied. Yeah, standard radio here, uh, both in GT3TP, 8 watts, uh, 14 inch mag mount on the top of the car, don't ask me what it is, I ain't got a clue. But uh, that's what we're using, working conditions this side. So it's all doing good, Roger. Yeah, Roger on that one, Rod. Yeah, much appreciated for the uh, quick radio report there. That's really, really good. So um, I'm really impressed with the signal quality and everything. Whatever you're using that side, it's coming through well anyway. But uh, I've been thinking about getting a mobile setup uh, sorted here as well. I was going to bring up a Diamond X50 maybe on a fine day, put it on in like a telescopic pole and maybe see what we can do from there, Roger. Oh, you're a crack out, mate. No worries at all. 
Yeah, uh, I've also got, I also come out portable with a beam, Roger, and that does well. Yeah, I'd like to hear you on the beam sometime. If you swung it around this direction, I bet it'd be end stopping to you there. But um, yeah, that's one good thing about this band. Uh, when you've got like a beam antenna of some sort, the, 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 the dimensions aren't very large, are they? So they're good, nice and portable, Roger. Yeah, that one of mine's only a little four element. Uh, yeah, you've no need to disassemble it or anything. Stick it in the back of the car and it is what it is. It does the bloody job. It does a fantastic job. I copied Jason uh, from Taster Top up to Stranra on the tip of Stranra in Scotland, 205 miles on that, Roger. Oh, that's an incredible distance, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if this evening uh, there's any lift conditions at all, but it's uh, over this side anyway, where I am, it's quite misty. Just looking out towards the bay and everything, um, you can hardly see anything at the moment. The foghorn's going up here, and uh, it's quite misty this evening, so I don't know if that's having any bearing on the signals tonight, Roger. Uh, it's possible, mate, it's possible. Uh, my visibility before I can uh, see you no more is probably about 12 or 14 miles and it is a very hazy in the distance. Yeah, Roger. Well, the sun's beginning to go down as well, so it's difficult to say from this location. But um, yeah, it's uh, certainly misty. Can't see much out to sea tonight or anything. No ships out at sea or anything. I can only just see Bridlington Bay from where I'm stood as well. So uh, yeah, I'm impressed anyway. Whatever it's doing, it's working well, uh, which is really great. But much appreciated for the radio report. I'm just going to stop the video there and um, Thanks very much for that, yeah? Copy, mate, no worries. Uh, you are flicking between a three and a four on this ball thing, Roger. Roger, Roger. Well, that'll do me for this little antenna on this thing. It's incredible, really. It's incredible it's making the trip. So uh, much appreciated on that one. However, there is a couple of downsides to this radio that I found. One of them is actually the uh, bugs in the firmware. And I found a couple of bugs that I don't really like that much about this radio. What you'll see is in the memory mode that we've got it in now, I programmed up the 16 PMR channels. I did this by hand because I had trouble getting the uh, computer software to actually work. I did download it from the official website and I just couldn't get it to go, despite being a standard Kenwood type jack. Um, so I've given up on that one, so I did actually program this by hand. But what I discovered is that when I put some frequencies in, uh, for the 16 PMR and deleted the ones that were pre-programmed from the factory I suddenly started getting some really odd ones appearing automatically like this one that doesn't make any sense up here 0.20.100 just appeared randomly in memory location 80 however trying to remove that memory causes the radio to reboot spontaneously and crashes when you turn it back on it goes back to factory defaults meaning that you've lost all your settings and it's basically gone back to Chinese not only Chinese display, Chinese characters too, so it took me about 10 minutes to work out how to get it back into English, which was a big problem. So that's something that maybe needs addressing in the firmware. So here's another interesting bug that I found in the firmware on this particular radio. When you hold down the star key to initiate a scan, like the one we've got going now, I've discovered that the number in the corner doesn't represent the proper channel number, it's always one down. So for example, if we start transmitting on channel 8 on PMR, as you'll see in a second there, it says 7 in the corner, so although the memory location is programmed as channel 8, it always shows 7 whilst it's in scan mode. The strange thing is, if we were to actually um, now stop the scan running and press the PTT button, notice how the number goes back to 8 again. So it's correct when it's actually just displaying like that, but when it's in scan mode it always shows it down one channel which is a curious little bug that I found in this particular transceiver. But anyway, that aside, it's a very, very good little radio. Uh, the audio quality can't be faulted. It sounds crisp, it sounds clear. If you're wanting something a little bit different, then maybe this is the radio. And like I say, uh, go and have a browse over to East Anglian Radio Services. I'll put a link in the description for the video so you can see where it's from. You can also buy off eBay or just have a word with Paul on the TM1 forums. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed looking at that radio as much as I did. Uh, if you happen to be in my part of the world, give us a shout on a Sunday night on PMR 446 Channel 8. If not, I will catch you on YouTube again for the next intriguing video. See you next time.